you know, a little drama puts a little more interest. But uh, accidents, how does it work out? Um, and more than accidents are accidents in nature. And this was what concerned my shelter for the last five years. Pier 1 was a social enterprise that was based basically on how do we provide the, the, the purest form of charity, which is to make ourselves obsolete. Handouts have a cash burn system. That means you help them once, linear, a week later, they'll come at your door again. How did this affect me with the millennium? The millennium was sort of a, a, an, an eye-opener for me because I was thinking like, isn't it too expensive for us to keep acting post-disaster? Why post-disaster? Because you use a consumption strategy, meaning to say food, medicines, and then after all, after, later on is refugee centers. Couldn't we do something with all those billions of pesos that we do every single year and move it ahead of the storm? Why ahead of the storm? Because maybe if we design something well enough, if we design for the future of a country that's vulnerable but least able to adapt, we can keep them safe. And later on, this will reflect very much afterwards with the number of people that we'll have to rehabilitate. Now, in the Philippines, we don't only have to preserve our environment, but we have the biggest next problem, which is designing against the elements. What happens when nature has been abused? And we have no way of protecting the people except this one thing, which is we always do, which is ask for funds after the storm. So here we are. I was looking at the, the, the paradigm. We have these thousands of storms that happened you know, this past, this past years. It, in fact, it looks like a spaghetti. This is from Manila Observatory. And every year we have 20 storms, and every year there's five of them destructive, and every year it looks like an act of God that we can't do anything about it. But to tell you the truth, it's becoming a science, which is, it's definite. But our survivability is not. As this thing becomes more intense, the more and more we're going to become more vulnerable. And if we act with a linear kind of solution, with an escalating problem, we're going to have more and more problems in the coming years. Because climate change is here and now. We didn't cause it but we are the front lines of it. Now, how do we deal with this? First of all, a lot of our projects has been on, climate, uh, on, on carbon mitigation. We use this kind of, of way to sensitize foreign countries to lower their carbon. If we had a windmill in every street corner or we shut off the whole Philippines, it will do nothing towards our typhoons. Maybe contribute a bit, but really we are I would say a very small fraction, but all of our efforts are doing there. So what am I saying? We have a full team of people going towards asking developing con uh, de de developed countries to, to lower their carbon. 80% deep drastic cuts. But then on the other side, so we're begging on this one, and on the other side, when the typhoon happens, we're also saying, please help us. So it seems that the way that we're dealing with climate change is completely out of our hands reactive and not enough proactive. So what my shelter has been doing is really looking at this thing, which is we're already hit by typhoons. But second is, instead of typhoons always hitting the Bicol region and then going up Isabella and out, the pattern is changing. In fact, it's going more and more intense. If you look at the, the increase in typhoons down south, people that have never had this kind of typhoons before. So we're looking at a new age of climate refugees, of climate crisis. What do we do active ahead of time when the costs are manageable, when creativity can be put into concrete structures? What I'm saying is concrete structures that last 50 years instead of donation model after the storm, which lasts weeks. If not, if you even look at it, the, 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 the effort of the volunteers didn't even last for two weeks. We did rock concerts to death. We did food racing to death. But what happens in the next storm? That is the problem that my shelter is facing. 
these are low-income villages in the rural areas. 70% of uh, our population is in the rural areas, a lot of it in the coastline. But the trend of thought has always been how to mass produce. Remember, poverty was the first big problem. So how do you mass produce housing to provide a decent place over their heads? In comes the variable, which is climate change. So 150 kilometer wind construction was all that it took to provide a nice house. Self-build and all of that. Great. But the problem is, what about when climate change comes in and destroys your whole model and makes it a shorter shelf life? What do we do? Ask donors to keep on repeating this cycle. So what we did was we tried to focus basically on classrooms. Why classrooms in the rural area? Because classrooms are where everybody runs to in, in case of typhoon. When their houses start collapsing, coco lumber, uh, this kind of knee, palm leaves, they go to classrooms. So we trapped it. The casualty rate is pretty low. A child's walk away is always a classroom. But then when the classroom collapses, that when, is when everything escalates. So what we did was basically look at what kind of areas we can focus on. Churches, Spanish churches were built 300 years ago plus. Their basic way of doing it was the Spanish never had this large amounts of distribution system, end-to-end -end kind of ways to build this kind of structures. They got what was there. So what we were thinking of is if we can empower the people to be able to have a system to be able to rebuild between empty land or giving them tents and cement, steel of glass, which we never know to have the budget, what about a future of empowered citizenry that knows how to build ahead or build after. Instead of going into a debt system, the problem is they always borrow money to be able to protect themselves better, but long term. What about a future when we have to move millions of people inside? This is another one that we're doing, which is vegan. How about using tiles that were for under your feet, but using that same tile system in an innovative, system, innovative way to put some kind of roofing sheet on top of people's heads that did not require mass amounts of manufacturing. So we, we're having this problem within, we're trying to control climate change, but then we're digging up, we're digging up large amounts of mountains for very little amount of material. How can we empower the future citizenry to not have a tent or not have a kind of a NEPA, small kind of things for this future of problems? Empowered, simple, but at the same time sustainable. Can be taught, can be replicated. But the most important part is how do we take ourselves out of the solution? Because if not, you are going to be part of the problem. Remember, when typhoons hit, no matter what NGO you are, if you have not empowered the community, there is no way that you can provide housing for the whole eastern seaboard of the country. Next is as it goes south, how many billions are it going to cost? We need some kind of new system. These are our first projects where we used uh, rice bags, working with an architect called Nadhir Khalili, an Iranian. We empowered fishermen and at the same time farmers to be able to build this kind of, oh, I have a monitor here actually, sorry, that's like, this kind of earthen school. One force cheaper, but at the same time can withstand 300 kilometers per hour winds. And it's not bad, it's not bad looking, especially if you learn how to treat lime. These are all systems that have been handed out. So somewhere along the line, when we wanted to mass produce, we kind of forgot the most essential part, which is the hand down of tradition in our country. How do we use that? And the most important is, instead of the, the Western model, which is, if I want to expand the house, if I want to change the house, if you build it out of cement, you crush that and you throw it into the landfill. One of our largest landfill is actually reconstruction redesign, demolishing. How do we look to a future when we have a cradle to cradle? Which is, we build it, and at the same time, we can destroy it and return it back into the ground. So a place of normal, where in normal times is, is for schools, where children study. It is the absolute critical point that communities be safe in the future because schools are becoming more and more important. Before, it used to be like, okay, build it cheap. That way, we can keep on rebuilding it every year. That way, we have an ongoing contract. But there will be a point wherein it will cost human lives. And this is what concerns us. 
If you have a cheap school, at least we teach them how to build a better school. Uh, sorry, I'm repeating this. Now, what about the areas that are not, not next to mountains? What is our tradition? First of all, we have 12% forest cover. A lot of people, they think that a million trees will be the solution. And that's right, except that it takes such a long time to make a million trees. What will be the housing of the next generation? We believe it is the poor man's material, which is bamboo. What would, what would bamboo, which is the, the, the material that really grows very quickly, like you can plant a lot of trees, but the survivability rate of that is much less than if you plant the same amount of bamboos. So you can plant a, 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 a balance, but bamboos are 35% more efficient in absorbing carbon. Second is the sustainability. As you build more schools, you create more farmers that create this bamboo, making the cycle of uh, cash flow within the system. What will it look like if farmers are empowered to build a school? They become the contractors, just like our earthen school. We made the people themselves who built the schools empowered to contract the schools once it was deemed fit. What, did it, what will it look like when people grow their own shelters? What if we can provide new designs that can withstand 250 kilometer per hour winds based on innovations? What we've left out is by going fully towards mitigation and going fully towards knowing how to raise funds after the disaster, we've forgotten the most essential part. How do we do things here and now? How do we make sure that populations don't go what I call the climate, psychology, uh, climate change psychology, which is the negative climate change psychology, which is when we can do nothing about it, We'd want to think when the sun comes out that it didn't really happen, that it was an accident, that it'll never happen again in our lifetimes. But what will happen in a future when the children will ask you, what did you do when the manifestations of climate change was so prevalent that it even came into the city and flooded 80% of the city? What more, what more knowledge would you need? What more awareness do you need? that the time to change is here and now. So our idea is how to empower the rural communities. This year, with Ondoy, we're looking at another big problem, which is we build so much housing in the urban landscape, but then what's going to happen in a future that's going to have basically communities isolated from the normal kind of utilities? What about lack of electricity? What about lack of water? What about lack of food? The, next, the reason why we did so much effort is because once they were surrounded by water, they were completely vulnerable and completely dependent on outside help. What would the next generation of low-income community look like? And this is what's concerning my shelter now. Ah, oh, wait. But before this, sorry, I was talking about Bourbon, but I forgot one more because I haven't built it yet. But the foundations are there. What about areas that exhibit very high amount of winds. What will be the solution? Tents, hot, and at the same time, when, the, when, when it rains, you can bar hardly hear the teacher. So what we did was we wanted something where light would come in. This is uh, working with Jacobs, uh, another architectural film. When the wind is low, the ceiling goes up. But you notice that if you watch like Everest and this kind of, uh, this kind of films, you'll see that they're in a thin tent. Frames of fabric, very thin, but at the same time, even in high winds, they survive. We want them to be able to sit there, wind to come in, but when typhoon comes in, how can we build something that we could withstand the storm? We believe that if we can prove this kind of designs can work, and we can already move towards acting ahead of the storms, the critical problem of local governments can be solved, which is a lot of their money is not going into infrastructure. A growing amount of it is going to aid, and at the same time, rehabilitation. What we're saying is, if we can provide safety ahead of the storm, maybe we can find a way to be able to save later on. Because at the same time, you know, there's this, you know, all these flash appeals. But flash appeals with structures that are built the same, which get destroyed the same, which you ask more and more amount of money, it's not going to be the wave of the future. So this uh, 2010 will be the designer challenge. 
wherein we're asking uh, 15,000 designers from around the world to come up with the next generation low-income housing. Do we want to build the next generation that's going to be block, stock, on block, on block, on block? Isn't it about time that we make it a way that this housing will be low impact with the environment? Can't we put more lights in? Can we put more ventilation in? But at the same time, in a new world where we should be braced for impact, what would it look like when these communities are flooded? Can it have a garden? Can it have a water system whereby it can be used maybe for flushing for one, but when they need it for long term, they will be able to be able to get the water? We are on the wrong track, but we can be able to strengthen and build up on the next generation. But more importantly, if you need to raise the funds every single time, then let's have a series of concerts ahead of time. We can't rock, our, we can't rock this away. <laughs> and at the same time, you will find out that most corporations that donated heavily last year, when the typhoons come in this year, you will find it another impact, which is the other inconvenient truth, which is there will be less to do more rehabilitation. So my shelter really thinks about how do we partner with people? How do we look to the future? How do we partner with corporations to design better? How do we partner with the poorest of the poor so that with simple tools and materials under their feet, they can not only provide an economy to themselves, but at the same time, look to a future wherein we are all going to be paralyzed unless we do something about the future of adaptability in the country. Thank you very much.